Numerical Computation, Chapter 10, Video 6. We now take a look at an example using finite difference method to solve a specific problem. Let's now consider this ODE, y double prime is negative 4y minus x in bracket with boundary conditions y0 is 0, y1 equals to 2. So it's easy to verify that the exact solution is given by this function here. It's some number times a sine to x plus an x. You can um, differentiate this twice and plug in on the left hand side and plug in y in here and you see the equation holds and you can easily verify the two boundary conditions are all satisfied. Yeah, but we are interested in a finite difference approximation. Okay, so let's fix an, a number m and we make a uniform grid. So h will be 1 over n because the interval length is 1. And xi will be ih because a is 0. And i runs from 0 to n. Okay, so the only term we need to throw in finite difference is the second derivative. So we're putting central finite difference. y double prime simply equals to this. That's the standard central finite difference. And this shall equal to the right-hand side, which was negative 4yi um, plus 4 xi, here xi is given here, is i times h. You could uh, um, rearrange terms and moving the yi to the left and also multiply both sides by h squared just to get rid of that denominator. Then you will have yi minus 1 here and uh, negative 2y and then you have this 4h squared yi moving to the left, joining them, you get that term and then you get y i plus 1, and what remains on the right hand side is this guy multiplied by h square. And we also have the two boundary conditions, that is um, y0 is 0 and y n equals to 2 is 0 and 2, the first and the last grid point. So we see that here we have n minus 1 equations, and we see the first equation touches the boundary y0, and then the last equation touches the boundary yn. And these are three consecutive um, indexes. So we see that this will end up in a tridiagonal system, isn't it? We always get tridiagonal system. Okay, so again, we end up with a tridiagonal system. Let's call it a times y bar equals to b bar. Okay, collecting my a matrix, I see on the diagonal I have negative 2, plus 4h squared, upper diagonals are 1, lower diagonals are 1. And the y vector is the vector of all my unknowns from y1, y2 to yn minus 1. And the b is the load vector, and it contains all the terms 4h squared xi for the ith component, plus two additional terms for the first equation and the last equation, where the boundary condition goes in. So this equation is um, an almost diagonal dominant. It's actually diagonal dominant for every h, but as h goes to 0, it gets close to just diagonal dominant. And it can be solved by Gaussian elimination, okay? And any other of our iterative methods, mm -hmm. Jacobian Gauss-Seidel, or SOR, and they will all converge. So we went to MATLAB and we coded it and we solved it, and here are some simulation results. For n equals to 10, I plotted the um, numerical solution, which are values at the grid points, by green circles, together with the exact solution, remember we know it, with this blue curve n equals to 10, so we ended up solving a 9 by 9 tridiagonal system. Okay, So we see that this is pretty good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The circles are almost on the curve. In order to see if the method converges as n increases and h decreases, we plot the arrow. We run the method for 
five different choices of n. n equals to 5, and we double it, 10, double it, 20, double it, 40, and double it, 80. So h becomes half each time. And we plot the arrow. Okay. So here's the graph. So the blue one here is when n equals to 5. And so the arrow is about 0 0.01, the maximum point, pretty big. And then you um, double the n, so you get 10 points, and this is the green curve for that arrow. You can still see kinks, those are the discrete points, because this is a, a linear spline connecting all points. Okay, so for n equals to 20, I get this red plot curve as the arrow. It's getting also even smaller from the green one, and then when n is 40, I get this cyan color one on this graph that looks very close to the zero. And if I do n equals to 80, and it's this um, purple one, which looks really close to the line zero in this plot. So what does this plot say to me? Well, still not that much, isn't it? So next I go about and find the maximum arrow for each age, and then I plot that maximum arrow against h, but I plot it using a log-log scale. So what I plot here is log of maximum arrow against log of h. Mm -hmm. And I see that I get a straight line. What is the slope of this straight line? Well, let's take a look. When h log h is negative 3, I have about negative 7. And when it's negative 4, I have about negative 9. So the slope equals to 2. What does that say? Can we have a guess of the order of this method based on this plot? What do you think the order will be? Okay, so here is the claim. Such a straight line with slope 2 in this log-log plot would indicate a second-order method. Why? Indeed, let's give a short proof. Assuming that the method is of order m in general, what does it mean? Well, that means the arrow is approximately equal to some constant times h to the power m. Okay, so C is a constant independent on H. Now we take log on both sides of this equation, then I have log E equals 2. So the multiplication breaks up into summation. I have log C plus, and then the power can be moved in the front. So I have M times log H. You see, if you plot log E against log H, this is a linear relation. The graph will have slope exactly equals to m. Therefore, the slope of that plot gives you the order of the method. Okay. Hope that was fun. You enjoyed it. And I'll see you next time.